host. Yeah, that would be okay. great. I would love to be the host. Okay. Thanks. And Mr. Call, whenever you're ready to call the meeting. All right, I see that it's five o'clock. Today is uh, Thursday, the 12th day of May, 2022. This is an appeals hearing um, by the uh, appeals hearing officer for Salt Lake City. And we have two matters on the agenda tonight. Um, they are uh, separate and distinct, and there'll be a different hearing and discussion on each of them. But let me add just a couple of general thoughts before we start. Number one, all I know about these uh, cases is what I read in the staff report, which included uh, some information provided by the applicant for the uh, either the non-conforming change or the variance. So don't assume I know much other than, of course, the staff reports are quite thorough and, and did show photos of the properties and other information. The way we do this, um, by the way, I, I have no, had no conversations. I have no information from anyone so that uh, my job is, is to use this hearing as a tool to uh, try to find out what I need to find out to make a decision on each of the matters. What we typically do is invite the person who um, called the party, the applicant for the uh, non-conforming use and the applicant for the variance to kind of explain what's going on, invite the city to respond. At that point, since these are public hearings, we're happy to hear from any member of the public that's joined us. Um, we invite the applicant to respond to the city and to any um, comments by the public. This isn't meant to be too structured. If the city has um, other thoughts, I'll hear them. Usually the last person to speak is the person who, who is the applicant or the person requesting the, the use. So any questions about all that at this point? Got to move quick. Okay. Well, let's take up item number one. This is a non-conforming change of use from retail goods establishment to alcohol bar establishment at approximately 1058 East 9th South. And this is uh, proposed by William Hamill. Mr. Hamill, are you here? Yes, I am. Great. Well, if you'd like to go ahead and explain the situation, we'll, we'll hear that matter. Thank you. Okay, yeah. Um... I am, uh, along with TN Broadway Properties, uh, the the building owner at the 1058 East 900 South. It has historically, as you may know, been an antique store with a vibrant hair salon upstairs. Um, when I was remodeling the building, which is still in prog progress, uh, we realized that it would be probably better suited for the neighborhood from speaking with many people to have it be, have more action, more activity at the building than an antique store. And that's where the brainstorming came up of having a wine bar, um, a wine bar that is not um, a very, it's a very low key idea in that, yes, it's alcohol, but it will be wine and uh, be served uh, till about, we thought, 9.30 to 10 p.m., whenever everything else closes down in the neighborhood other than the ice cream shop. Mm -hmm. So speaking with people, um, we realized that the neighborhood didn't want another antique store, uh, but they wanted a vibrant community building business, a business that created diversity maybe to the neighborhood. And looking at uh, the East Liberty survey that I think um, Martin, I think Diana, you have that, but I don't know if Craig, from what he opened up with, I don't think he's read that survey of what um, 
the neighborhood wants in the ninth and ninth district, which does go to 1100 East, um, um, under, is the way I understand it. But people stopping by and saying, what's it going to be? And saying, oh, oh, a wine bar would be fantastic. That sounds like a great idea. Um, and I think that since the staff report, there were some emails um, to to Diana that um, were encouraging that that I saw at least that was, I was copied on. But um, yeah, so we this wine bar is the intent, even though it was an antique store. Um, the intent is um, to do what we think is an, an add to the neighborhood, not a subtract. Um, I realize the wine bar is not the same uh, as the antique store, yet I also realize today the neighborhood wants the wine bar. I think this mixed use creates the vibrancy and walkability that I've heard the neighborhood wants. And they want a lot of the wine, a lot of the uh, neighbors and businesses east of 900 East, all the way to 1100 East, want that vibrancy and the action to come eastward. Um, so that's kind of the intent of, in short of it, of what we were proposing. Thank you. Let me um, clarify a little bit about my role here. My, my job is simply to answer a question, a narrow one, and then support my answer with the right set of facts and evidence, interpretation of the code. The, the question is simply, is a wine bar, alcohol bar establishment sufficiently similar to an existing non-conforming use of retail goods establishment to allow the change of use? So while I um, can appreciate the, the policy idea, you know, why it would be a good thing and why the neighbors want it, I, I don't know how to take that into account because I'm only interpreting the code. The policy questions are for the city council who writes the code and it's, I'm just a guy from out of town. <laughs> so I, I don't try to substitute my uh, judgment for that of the local policymakers. Just read the narrow wording of the code and try to figure out how the facts of this case fit to it. So I, I don't mean to distract everybody. Let me invite someone from the city to make a comment or Mr. Hamill, if you'd like to respond to that, or, you know, I don't mean to make this again, like I said, two structures. Yeah, no, I, I respect um, the city's comments and I've read them thoroughly. And um, I think that that is the thinking from the reason in 2001. That is the code. So I guess is the code black and white? or is there a gray area? Is there actually a consideration with the city in what is best for the ninth and ninth district? Did they well, consider that? Thanks, let's have the city respond. I don't mean to conduct just a two-way conversation here and the city staff, of course, deals with these things more than I do. So please go ahead, someone from the city. Okay, hey, that would be me. This I am Diana Martinez, I'm staff uh, principal planner um, I think the direction that Mr. Hamill is asking about is more of the zoning and and whether that's what is met today. And that's that's kind of not what the issue is today. Today is not a rezone application or a rezone uh, modification or map amendment or text amendment to the zone. Um, typically, this your pursuit of putting in an alcohol bar establishment would probably go through more so a rezone to the area because the current zoning does not allow the previous use, which was retail goods establishment or the proposal alcohol bar establishment. So typically we would say that you would have to go through a rezone to change the zoning to meet those needs of the use that you want to put in. Um, and Mr. Call, are you okay if I start my presentation and kind of go from there into the city's view of that? That'd be fine. By the way, sorry to sip during the conversation, but you're making me thirsty. 
Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> yes, no problem. We're talking about beverages, and that sounds good. Go ahead. Okay. So, on that note, I want to clarify that this is not a conditional use application. This is not a rezone application. This is a specific application to determine whether the proposed use of alcohol bar establishment is sufficiently similar to the previous use of retail goods establishment to allow the change to be done on this property. Now, typically, non-conforming uses are uses that exist until they're either abandoned or a change of use that doesn't meet the requirement comes about and then it's no longer non-conforming. It's either a use that fits in the zone or like I said previously, a rezone would take place, some kind of zoning map or text amendment. The current zoning on this property is SR1. The purpose of the SR1 or Special Development Pattern Residential District is to maintain the unique character of older, predominantly single family and two family dwelling neighborhoods that display a variety of yards, lot sizes, and bulk characteristics. Now, like I said, because of the residential zoning of SR1, retail goods establishment, the previous use, and alcohol bar establishment, the proposed use, are not allowed in this zone. So by ordinance, we are looking at this application to see if one, the non if the retail, excuse me, if the retail goods establishment is a non-conforming use on this property, and whether the proposed use of alcohol bar establishment is similar to that land use. So for this application, staff analyzed three considerations to see if it met the requirements of the non-conforming change of use ordinance. These three considerations that are in the staff report were whether the previous use of retail goods establishment is non-conforming. The second one was whether the subject property would be able, would be able to provide the required off-street parking on site. And lastly, whether the previous and proposed uses are similar land uses. Staff analysis found that the retail goods establishment at this location is non-conforming. It has been there since approximately 1960 when the building was built, and it has maintained active business licenses for this type of use. The parking ordinance requirements are the same for the previous and the proposed use. This being one space per 2,000 square feet of usable floor space. The last consideration is whether the two uses are similar. Staff looked at three zoning districts that allow residential use and neighborhood commercial mix. In all three, retail goods establishment were permitted uses and alcohol use establishments were listed as conditional uses. This means as a conditional use, an alcohol bar establishment would have to go through the conditional use process and would be subjected to conditional use standards and possibly conditions, as well as the alcohol related establishment standards, which are found in ordinance 21A.36.30. There is also an outdoor dining patio that is proposed. And staff believes that this intensifies the use because it is a residential use. And now you've added outside dining, which causes um, more noise. Um, there are residential dwellings to the east and the west. Um, and, and that could be a nuisance to them. On that note, I want to clarify one thing that was very much mentioned in a lot of the um, emails from from the public that the that the residents or the dwelling to the west a lot of people kept on saying it's a commercial use it is not a commercial use it is actually in this same zone in the sr1 it was given um, by the board of board of adjustments um, in 2000 it was given a home occupancy approval for an office but our zoning certificates do show that it is a two, it is a legal two family dwelling 
So again, it meets the requirements or the meaning of residential. Um, one thing that the staff also wants to note is that the proposal for this site is a wine bar. And that to us doesn't really mean much because we don't classify it like that. And, and, and so we have to use the term alcohol bar establishment by ordinance. So many of the people that wrote in have thought that the wine bar would be a great ad, added use to this area. And that may be true. However, this use, if approved by the appeals officer, does not have to remain a wine bar. It could be any type of alcohol bar establishment. And that can be a brew pub. It could be, um, excuse me, cheating at my notes, a brew pub. It could be a tavern or just a regular bar that serves any kind of alcohol, beer, wine, liquor. Um, one other thing to address is that many people were, were concerned about the time that this would, would close. And many suggested that a 930 or a 1030, similar to a use across the street, which is in a different zone, um, that wouldn't be under our jurisdiction. That would be a state jurisdiction and the hour could go up to one o'clock at night to close. So I just wanted to put that in the record. Based on the findings of the staff report, the planning division recommends denial of the proposed change of the retail goods establishment to alcohol bar establishment. The findings are that it is too intense. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Hamill, we'll invite you to respond in just a second. Let me check and see if there's anyone here in this public meeting who'd like to speak to the subject. I think we're going to have a uh, number of people, um, Mr. Call, that are, are, we have a lot of people in the attendee list, and we'll also have a couple of emails that we are, are going to, to read into the record because they were submitted um, after the fact. So if this is a time that you'd like to open the public hearing, I can go ahead and start calling on folks. Yes, let's do that. Okay, for those of you in the attendee list um, that are attending and would like to speak on this matter, there is a, a little hand. You have to open up your participants panel, I think it is. Um, and there's a little hand button you could pick, and that will let us know that you want to speak. Um, and then I'll go through and, and start picking on those folks first. If you can't find the hand, I, I may just probably go through and ask everybody if they want to speak. But I do see a uh, hand that is raised um oh, so when i do notice that um the community councils in the in the list i don't know if they were planning on speaking but the community council representative jason stevenson oh yes thank you um jason would you like to speak tonight hi can everyone hear me okay yes hi thank you for for noticing that appreciate it um we just have a very brief comment and that is that you know we appreciate the the city um, allowing this hearing, it, it certainly is something that uh, we as a community council are interested in participating in. And we found that our community members, when we alerted them to this proposal, were very engaged. Um, uh, you mentioned wine bar and everyone perks up, you know, um, I guess is one way to put it. Um, so we also appreciate uh, Diana Martinez clarifications about the actual specifics of what this hearing is about. Some of those nuances are lost on me, and certainly it's very difficult to explain to community members exactly what these things are about. Um, and I just would like to refer um, the hearing officer and uh, members of the city staff to the three-page letter that ELPCO submitted, and I apologize it was just this afternoon, um, about this process and about the proposal, including some you know, next steps that uh, the community council would be interested in taking if this application or this uh, request is denied including rezoning um, and in other proposals. So just wanted to mention that uh, our letter kind of contains everything that we had and we look forward to hearing from more members of the public. Um, as many have sent in emails and uh, contributed and, and we appreciate the people are on this meeting as well. Thank you. Mr. Stevenson. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I have not seen that letter. Could you kind of just give me the highlights of it? Sure, I'd be glad to, sir. 
Um, so we found out about the hearing on Tuesday. I was actually walking my dogs and my kids, and I saw the poster, which is uh, always a good thing when those posters are up. It's just a great way to get people's attention. Uh, so we immediately, as a board of the East Liberty Park Community Organization, started talking about um, what we thought of this proposal. Um, and then also reached out to the ninth and ninth business community. We have an email list of about 70 people just to let them know in case they hadn't seen the notice. Um, and encouraging members of the public and the community to um, submit comments, um, to learn about the proposal, read the staff report and submit comments. Based on our review, we were able actually to apply uh, information we gathered from a survey back in 2019, where we asked specifically uh, to our residents, we had 400 respondents to this survey, would you like to see more alcohol-focused um, uh, businesses in the ninth and ninth area, particularly bars and brew pubs, I think were the term we used. Uh, and 80%, I believe, I can't remember if that's right, 79 to 80%, I think, responded affirmatively to that. Other questions we asked in this 26-question survey also showed that there was an interest in more um, entertainment and alcohol-focused or alcohol-friendly businesses in the community. This was before the opening of the uh, or right around the opening of the East Liberty Tap House on the other side of the Ninth and Ninth Business District. So it was certainly something that was, was not uh, especially present among the businesses that were there. So we wanted to bring this to the attention of folks that there is a public survey out there with 400 respondents that showed there is public interest in this type of establishment. Uh, of course, we realize that that is not necessarily the question at stake here, um, mm -hmm. but uh, we wanted to bring that information to the forefront because uh, that survey was something that um, we, we did do, and we realized people forget after a couple of years that it's out there. Um, other information in the letter that we submitted included just our interpretation at the East Liberty Park Community Organization that the Ninth and Ninth business community does extend further east along Ninth South than just the core business district around the Ninth and Ninth intersection. We see quite a few businesses um, uh, starting um, and growing. Uh, building new buildings on the eastern edge of uh, the ninth and ninth business district from contender bicycles to the new essential photo supply shop that's there um, to the uh, renovation going on at the public kitchen which is a, a big project um, and businesses have told us that they want more foot tracks that they want more um, they, they want the business district to extend further eastward um, uh, up to the whale i guess we could say because we now we have a giant whale on the eastern edge of that uh, business district if you haven't heard about that yet seems everyone has uh and so that was something we, wanted that we felt the business district is something that uh, uh doesn't just sit at the ninth and ninth intersection but really goes all throughout um that ninth south corridor uh and the third thing we wanted to reference was that we felt that the we don't want to open up a can of worms through this decision we realize that if the zoning isn't right and that doing this decision or allowing this um uh and it's not a conditional use, I now know, but just allowing this this uh, um, uh, non-conforming use, I guess, would be the way to describe it. If that creates further problems, we don't want to compound uh, uh, compound bad decisions, let's just say. So that the rezoning actually is the better way forward to create a sustainable and sort of logical zoning plan for the ninth and ninth business district, then we would be in favor of that. We we don't want to to rush into something and 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 do something. Uh, just to get it done, but would like to make it right and stick. So those were the main points that we established in the letter, sir. Thank you, appreciate it. Please go ahead, Mr. Mills. Okay, so next up is um, Susan McCoff. Yes, yes, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, I've written something that I will read if that's okay. Um, I am speaking against the change of use from retail goods establishment to an alcohol bar establishment at 1058 East 900 South. Um, unlike a retail goods establishment, an alcohol establishment will attract and create a steady stream of traffic and noise during hours well outside of those uh, for a typical retail goods establishment intruding on to nearby residential private property. Um, parking, as you guys have mentioned, is an issue for residences and businesses alike where there is already tight parking. A question of more traffic and of course noise pollution 
at early daytime hours and late hours of the night from delivery, garbage, and recycling trucks. Just a second, come in. Um, the following have been observations by residents in a similar situation near Liberty um, East Tap Room. So, what I've heard, I, um, let's see. They they mentioned noise and disruption of traffic flow on Ninth South. Trucks for delivery, garbage disposal, and recycling making deliveries and collections are there on their business all day long, daily, with noise from backing up in large trucks, not being able to get into the parking lot, and bark, um, blocking the road to make their deliveries. So though there are rules for control of trucks, such as time of delivery. They've not been enforceable. Um, there's also a question, of course, of garbage containers, dumpsters, which attract vermin, rats, and mice. So more specific to the 1058 East 9th South situation is the following. In recent years, the city has created the McClellan Trail designation for wa walking and biking. More traffic from trucks and additional cars is contrary to the purpose of this trail. The present and past occupants of 1058 East 900 South have had a low impact on the currently quiet neighborhood and have been good neighbors themselves. The back parking lot has always been such a small space where only two, maybe three vehicles can fit. The big question of where garbage containers and dumpsters may be placed, um, where the lot is so small. In the past, however, vehicles that have plowed snow and made deliveries and collections have knocked over the fence on the adjoining property at 915 South McClelland, which is in back of the property we are looking at. And it happens to be my property. Nearly it's um, when the fences have been knocked over, nearly knocking out air conditioning units on the adjoining property. The space between the home on the residential adjoining property and the fence bordering the parking lot is five feet. And I sent a photo on to um, Ms. Martinez. So you may or may not have that in front of you. So finally, in speaking with businesses this week, with businesses who are nearby, there is a concern for customer parking where there is already a problem on both 9th South and McClelland, both North and South of 9th South, as well as on other nearby streets. So that that is, those are my comments. Okay, let me just make a note. You're saying that that this is not similar to the antique retail use. Right. Because of stream of traffic and noise, deliveries, uh, parking, uh, backing well, up trucks, and that sort of thing. Um, hold on. I've got somebody else here who wants to make a comment. Yeah, I, I live next door. Come on. And your name? I'm Sherry Matthews Moyes. I live at 923 South McClelland and I've been here for about 33 years. Um, M O Y E S. Uh huh? Okay. Thank you. Um, it's striking to me that they would even be considering this as similar usage, um, category for a bar as compared to the antique store, not so much. The difference in the names, but. I have lived here, as I said, for a long time, and I walk frequently along night south past that business several times a week, and I've done that forever. 
um, in all the years that I have done that, I have probably seen perhaps two people at the most in that antique shop at the most. The majority of the time it has been closed. It is not usually open for business. So we're talking about going from a place that has really, really low usage and impact to something that is significantly more impact. And I frankly don't think that they even remotely resemble um, the same kind of usage. Um, and in addition, I agree with Susan, um, the neighborhood has gone through a lot of transitions. We've put a lot of thought and time into making this a very walkable, safe, family-oriented neighborhood. Um, the McClellan bike trail is amazing and awesome. And we just put so much money into making 900 South have wide avenues for walking and for people to use their bikes and to cycle. And it's had an impact on the parking. So even if I try to, for say instance, during the day, if I wanted to pop over across the street to a, the Granary Bakery, which is directly across from this proposed bar, they have, they share a spot with three other businesses, I think at least. And there are maybe, I don't know, eight or nine parking spots. They're always full. Um, those are always full. And then usually there's a limited number right in front of where this bar would be. They're almost always full. So it's really difficult to see how big delivery trucks are going to be able to maneuver, not just into that small alley and then back behind the bar without causing traffic congestion on top of which it is now right directly what 100 feet from the roundabout we just put in a roundabout there so that we could have increased traffic flow and have fewer problems because we used to have a lot of congestion at the intersection of 900 south and 1100 east we put in a roundabout that made a huge difference and we've made it more and, narrow and we've made it more narrow so okay. it's really kind of counterintuitive to the steps that we've been taking the past seven or eight years um, and I do think as somebody that lives with the alley behind us, Susan and I and the rest of the people on McClelland have an alley that goes behind our house. Um, one way in yeah. and the same way out. Yeah, one way in the same way out. Um, and it, the noise, the noise is another factor. The noise literally will travel right from that business across Susan's backyard into our backyard and further on down the street. So. That's okay. Thank you. Sure. Thank you for listening. Let me just add one side comment. The, the assumption I would have to make is that the retail antique store could be replaced with a much more intensive retail use. And it, again, as Ms. Martinez um, said in her discussion, we look at a typical bar and a typical retail. So for what that's worth. Who's next, Wayne? Okay, um, and just a reminder for those of you that would like to speak, if you could hit that little hand button. Um, and for those of you, um, maybe Ms. Bukov, if you could hit that button again and lower your hand, it'll kind of help keep things under control. Okay, next is um, Carolina Hasbin. You've been unmuted and you can speak, Carolina. Uh, Carolina, can you hmm. hands raised, but not able to speak off. Oh, go ahead. Okay. Sorry. I'm not very familiar with WebEx and I just had to switch my speaker. Oh, that's okay. Um, yeah. Thank you for giving me a few minutes. Um, I wanted to join this meeting to voice my support, um, of this proposed use of space. Um, I actually live at 922 South 1100 East, so our house is on the other side of the alleyway um, from McClellan, and we've lived here for about eight years and seen a lot of changes um, in the neighborhood and walk our dog around this neighborhood and child around the neighborhood quite frequently. Um, when I heard about what the space could potentially be, it was really exciting. Um, I think part of the reason, and someone mentioned this earlier, part of the reason the prior business um, maybe was such a good neighbor is because the antique shop was never opened. And so <laughs> it's <laughs> it was never open. Um, I, I never saw 
anyone in there ever in eight years of walking our dog around the block. Um, and so I think whatever business replaces or is using that space, I think it will automatically bring more foot traffic um, and just more interest uh, eastward of Ninth and Ninth towards quote unquote the whale. Um, and so I, I, I recognize a lot of these concerns are very valid. Um, I also recognize I don't live right next to this proposed um, wine bar space, but I live close enough to where it's a really exciting prospect. Um, and certainly the area around my house would also be affected. Um, I have just a couple thoughts I wanted to put out there. There has been some mention of the McClellan Trail. Um, my husband and I and, and our son have used that here and there, and it's very nice. It's very neighborhood friendly. You know, who's to say people aren't going to use the McClellan Trail to get to this wine bar? Because I think that is a distinct possibility. And I think people are probably using that avenue now to get to 9th and 9th um, and forego driving to the neighborhood and parking. Um, I think if this committee could be open to that idea, I, I think it is a synergistic thing between the McClellan Trail and having increased business activity at 9th and 9th. I don't necessarily think those two things would rule each other out. Um, and in terms of foot traffic, I think there could actually be more foot traffic, honestly, on our end of 9th and 9th. Um, there have been times when I've walked around at night and I've actually, I've lived in urban areas before where it was relatively safe to go out because there was increased foot traffic at night and you're not just kind of walking around on your own down a dark street with your dog. Um, there's other people out. I don't know. I think it, it would be better for public safety, actually, if there was increased foot traffic, um, not through all hours of the night, but I think 9.30 or 10 as a closure time is pretty, I think it's pretty realistic. And in terms of parking, so I think parking is an issue all across the city. I think it's, an, it's not just an issue at 9th and 9th. Um, I don't have a good solution for that, to be honest. But I know just being a frequent walker in this neighborhood, there's always street parking on surrounding streets. Even our street, 1100 East, which is a much busier street than McClellan or anything that's anything in between 1100 East and 900. Um, all of those side streets, they all have street parking available almost at all hours of the day. Um, the alleyway that is directly around the corner that could maybe be used by the big delivery trucks to make their deliveries. I think the houses on either end from 1100 East and McClellan, they don't necessarily have to use the alley to park their cars. There's street parking in the front as well as the driveways on the side of the house. And so those are all the comments I had. Thank you, appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Okay, you know, I'm not seeing any more hands, but uh, honestly, I, I think I, there's not a lot of folks in the, and so I think I'm going to go one by one. I want to make sure that we're giving people an opportunity to speak who may not be familiar with with the interface here. So I apologize, everybody, if I put you on the spot by asking you if you want to speak, but um, kind of bear with me for a minute here. Uh, Corey Dearden, do you want to speak on this matter? Corey? No, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Would you yeah. like to speak on? No, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, David uh, Weber, would you like to speak on this? Uh, no, I don't have anything to add. Great, thank you. Uh, Dennis Ferris, would you like to speak on the matter? Dennis? 
Okay. No. Uh, Jer Jeremy Speckman, would you like to speak on this matter? Uh, sure. Uh, I am happily married to Carolina Hasman, uh, my better half who already spoke, so she speaks for me already. But uh, thank you again for this opportunity. This is a great democracy and civic action. Uh, I am very in favor of it. Uh, my wife kind of summarized it. And just, you know, when I want to go to Sugar House to get a, a drink at one of the bars there, I specifically take the McClellan Trail to get there. I think it's a great access. The McClellan Trail, where the bar would be or where this business would be, uh, is actually not really a trail. It's just the street, the road that you basically, the bikes have to share with the, the cars anyway. It's a pretty quiet street in general. So when we say it's a trail, I think we should just be careful that we're actually just talking about a street at this point. Um, and I think that as, and as my wife said, and as other, the business, other business owner said, I've never seen anyone in the entire antique store. It, so even if let's say we, we didn't rezone this and it be, uh, you know, became just a residential space and the children's hour from ninth and ninth moved to the split business, it would be a major disruption, but totally legal and ethical. Of course, um, they would just bring a lot of cars there and they would do on-street parking, as my wife mentioned. So I think whatever we're gonna go in any direction, uh, and parking is never gonna get solved, but I don't think it's a stifle growth of this neighborhood and of the city and of, of business opportunity. So thank you for letting me speak. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Kimberly Dearden, would you like to speak? I'm actually waiting for the next meeting. Okay, great, thank you. Um, Mary Ellen Sessions, would you like to speak on the matter? I just, uh, I, I'm waiting for the next meeting, but I just want to know, is it not against the law to have be drunk and walking in Utah or biking in Utah anymore? That's my only opinion on this meeting. Okay, that's kind of outside of the scope of this one, but so we'll move on here. Uh, Carlos Ramirez, would you like to speak on the matter? No, thank you. No, thank you. Okay, thank you. Scott Maynard, would you like to speak? Yes. Great. Thank you. Um, I just want to say I'm Scott. I'm the owner of the um, aforementioned Vibrant Hair Salon. <laughs> In the upstairs portion of the building, um, moving into my 14th year there. And I personally welcome the change. I think that um, I know that in my experience, it has been difficult to maintain a, a business that's commercially viable in a building that lacks synergy. I, for nearly 14 years, have effectively held up that building because as it's been aptly pointed out for the majority of those years the downstairs bay was empty and it has been a struggle to you know to build my business and get it as reasonably successful as it is now i welcome the opportunity for change for innovation and creativity below my feet um something that would um add benefit to the immediate neighborhood uh, on the south side of the street we see lots of businesses on the north side there are no businesses on the south side except myself and the, the drive through coffee shop on 11th and then all the way down to nearly 9th and 9th katie waldman despite the fact that there's been a great deal of um well, there's frankly, there's been a lot of emphasis on the idea that it would be best for everybody if I somehow managed to conduct my business and stay stable and employ staff and pay wages and put food on the table for people that work for me. If I lived in, in and worked in an empty shell, perhaps a morgue downstairs would be best. It's all quiet. <laughs> But no, rather, I suggest that the idea that's being proposed is an excellent one. And I think it's time for it. 
I think that many of the understandable and 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 um, arguable complaints come with every city and every community. As was aptly pointed out earlier, parking is just a problem everywhere. It always has been, it always will be, and we innovate through the problem. I think that I think that Will has suggested, you know, this entire application and the entire concept that Will has is very respectful of the neighborhood that's that that's around. We know that there's going to be issues with noise. We know, he knows very well that there'll, there'll, there'll have to be innovations made. It took 80 years plus to put a roundabout in an intersection that had five, a five way stop, 80 years to figure out that a roundabout might be better. We're suggesting, I think Will is, is very, very beautifully put forth a lot of expense on the building. And I think that the idea of a wine bar is a good one. I, 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 I don't want to work in an empty shell. I want people to embrace the idea that there can be a very quiet, engaging business downstairs. I already am there saying hello to everyone who walks by, not just, uh, you know, everyone and their dogs. And I would like the opportunity to wave them in downstairs and invite them for, um, you know, to sit down. Um, as it stands right now, I could invite them upstairs to get their hair done. <laughs> mm -hmm. But it would be nice. And I think that it's a welcome change. And I think the time has come for nearly 14 years. Holding up that building myself. With an empty shell, of, you know, downstairs. Of course, it was quiet. It's because it was it was just empty. And. Anyway, I, I can appreciate everyone every, everyone's comments, but I must say that innovation and creativity is necessary. Change is necessary, but I do know this. I do know that any changes that have been proffered for the downstairs bay on that building are are being done with residents in mind. This is and it's not proposed that this be a you know alcohol swilling slap down live band loud venue it's supposed to be one that literally is in consonance with this environment quiet polite upscale so i know that there's going to be issues to work through i feel that we can work through them there is a way and uh, and and it's nice to be that everyone is is being heard their concerns um noise and so forth i don't envision giant big trucks either i see small vans delivering small cases of wine and a bit of cheese you know <laughs> i think that perhaps some of these issues might be a bit overstated but well put you know well received and i don't think that we should be short-sighted um on this I, again it's great for everybody if the building's empty but it's not good for people like me. And I don't think that it's good for my employees. I don't think that in the big, bigger picture, it's good for the community to have that building as empty as it has been for so many years. What's being suggested is that the building grow along with its community around it. You know, it wasn't that long ago, there wasn't a tsunami across the street. Um, uh, there, there was an improvement to the street. There wasn't a roundabout. I think that it's time for, for some change. Um, thank you for the opportunity to talk. Again, I'm Scott. I own this salon, this thing, and it's still there. And um, I'm glad for the opportunity to say my bit. Thank you, Scott. Okay, just a couple of more here. Um, Sarah, would you like to speak on this matter? No. Okay. I don't. Yeah, I don't. I, I am a resident. I've been a resident at 965 South McClelland. Um, and I'm 100% for it. I agree with everything Scott said. And I've just loved watching ninth and ninth kind of grow. 
And I think, um, I think it will be hard. There will be aspects of it that are hard, but I'm in full support of it. What's your last name, Sarah? Brown, like the color. All right, thank you, Sarah. Okay, last but not least, Trevor, would you like to speak? No, I'm just here to listen. All right, thanks, Trevor. Um, actually, now, Amy, if uh, if you'd like to read those couple of emails we received. Yeah, so we have a couple emails that weren't forwarded to um, the Dropbox yet, but we will send those um, that have come in. The first one is from Louis Borganich. Um, I hope I say I'm hope I hope I'm saying that right. Um, the comment is, I have no problem with the proposed wine bar, just the parking. The next comment um, is just from 218 South. Um, that's the name listed on the email. Hello, we are the homeowners and live on 1000 East between 900 South and Belmont and would like to share a note of support for the wine bar that's being proposed. We'd like to see business expand beyond the main intersection of 9th and 9th and welcome the idea of a wine bar in the intimate space below M. Scott Salon. It would be great to increase the number of gathering spaces along 900 South that are open after dark. Thank you, Tanya and Josh. Tanya and Josh, sorry. Um, the next one is from Marcus Lopez. Hi, Ms. Martinez and planning committee. As long as a longtime resident in the Gilmer Park neighborhood, I have enjoyed the addition of restaurants heading east from 9th and 9th intersection. The addition of Tsunami and Bakery are welcome to the area. One of the complaints was lack of establishments such as the proposed wine bar. My wife and I are in complete favor of adding a wine bar, bar to this part of Salt Lake City. This is certainly a value add to adding foot traffic to the businesses on Upper 9th and helps connect the street from the art installation down to the 9th and 9th sign. I hope that the city takes these comments to heart and allows this establishment to proceed as a wine bar. Thank you, Marcus Lopez. And those are the only comments that I have that were not forwarded to the hearing officer. And I did see those early e earlier emails and reviewed them. Thank you. I'm not seeing any more hands raised and I, I think we made it through. Good. Well, thank you. And thank you for the comments. Someone? Uh, someone? Yep, right here. I didn't know how to raise my hand. This is Peter Clark. I'm, I'm listed as part of the panel. <laughs> oh, maybe both an attendee and the panel member. <laughs> is it okay if I say something in support to it with Will? Certainly. Sure. Yeah, so I guess, you know, I could be the one who's directly involved with it since I'm kind of, you could say the boots on the ground, right? Because I'm the listing agent. Um, I'm the one who's talking to the potential tenants, the ones who are coming by and asking me all the questions. I'm actually also the owner of Windermere Real Estate, which is right across the street. So above the Tsunami restaurant. Um, I've lived in the area as well for probably, I think, 20 years now and put my kids through school here and all that. So I've seen the neighborhood grow and, you know, I've taken, I've taken flack for better or for worse as far as some of the development because I've sold most of the properties, I've sold um, and leased up most of the buildings around and, you know, for better or worse, right? Um, me personally, I would like to see it a pedestrian only street, but that's a different discussion from here, you know? Um, and so I think that's what lends this community driven discussion. Um, it, it, it started off by coming towards me where uh, we have the place for lease and we know that it's a retail store and um, going from retail to retail is easy, right? But the intensification of it, I think if you just opened up a person sleeping in there would probably intensify the use anyway. <laughs> because a lot of it has been completely stagnant. There hasn't been anything happening to the building. It's been falling apart and it wasn't maintained. And so now we have a great owner who's willing to come in and really clean it up, bringing it back to the 1960s roots of it. You know, it's a mid-century, it's a really cool building and it has really neat glass and brickwork and it has that ability, ability to invite people in. 
And so I think that this whole discussion has been completely community driven. You know, we could put somebody in there that is as intense or way more intense as a retail store, right? So you could take a candy store and you could fill that thing up with candy and gum and sticky stuff and sugar and all that, right? And I think that would still be just as intense or maybe more than a wine bar because I don't want to get, you know, the almost the stigma of it having the word alcohol bringing that to it because I think there's a, a lot of other retail uses that are really intense as well. So what does that do, right? And maybe we could get help um, because this is something that the community really wants. And we believe that it is going to be cohesive. Um, it will be bringing people together because of the, the bike lane and the walking walkability. And we believe that this will keep help keep cars off the street too. So we can look at that argument that it's, it's, it's um, less intense because now people are walking to the establishment rather than driving and parking. And I think that as um, the area gets more dense, we need to have these small little retail shops, retail services, retail goods, and we need to be able to provide that to the community so that people aren't driving as much and they're walking a lot more or riding bikes, right? So I would be a, a proponent saying that, look, this is less intense than um, putting in just another retail store in there or another furniture store. I mean, I had furniture stores coming to me left and right saying, look, we want to put our furniture out front and we wanted to have parties so people can see what kind of um, outdoor furniture we have. Um, I've had, you know, outdoor retailer clothing lines coming across, like from Patagonia to North Face to um, Steo. I don't know if you know these companies, but, uh, or nail salons. I mean, nail salons are the same type of retail service, right? So they, those bring their own problems as well. So as far as the, in, the intensifying of the use, right, I think maybe you can help us figure out how we can navigate that. And, and like, um, I think Jason was saying too, that we're okay with going through the process. Um, but we just want to make sure that we do it correctly rather than jumping into something or being denied something that could really impact the community in a better way. Does that make sense? Yes. Thank you. I guess that's about all I have. We're in the time frame. Thank you. Um, there's, excuse me, there's no other, uh, no other public comment. So we can All right. close the public hearing, I believe. Let's close the public hearing. Um, let me uh, turn first, if I may, to uh, William Hamill. Do you want to respond or make a comment at this point? I will ask the city to comment and then come back to you, but... Um, Give you the first crack at it here. Okay. Either way. Um, well, I, I just want to thank everybody and their comments and thoughts. I respect them all. Um, at the end of the day, really what I want is to do, to be a community builder, to continue that. I've been a business owner for uh, about 30 years and I've always entrusted in myself and my staff to um, work towards being a community builder. So whatever is right for the neighborhood and whatever the steps are to to do that, um, that's what that's what I want. Thank you. Just taking a note here. Ms. Martinez or others from the city's point of view. Yes, thank you. I just want to point out one one thing. Um, in regards to this site versus another site. So down at the 9th, South, 9th, East intersection, um, there's been mention of the East Liberty um, pub house, I think it's called. Sorry about that if I'm getting it wrong. Um, that was a conditional use in the community business district. And that did need to go through the, con the conditional use process, was subjected to conditional use standards and was also subjected to the alcohol-related establishment standards. 
in this location, those standards would not apply. It would just come in with a business license and have to follow state state regulations. The closing time again could be as late as 1 o'clock. There's no stipulation by the city to hold it at 930 or or 1030 closing like the neighboring properties to the north. So I just want to keep in mind that for everybody that this intense use is intense because if you're going to compare it to the bar down the street that had to go through all those other standards, this is too intense for a residential zone. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hamill, anything else? Uh, no, I don't, I don't think so. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I appreciate the discussion and it's been very helpful to have the comments of those that are most concerned, of course, the people who live and work and and uh, enjoy the life of that area. And and by the way, thanks so much for making it such a wonderful area. I've been kind of a pan, fan of the Tower Theater over the years and also the other retail and eating establishments that have been there and 9th to 9th is a great area. So it sounds like there's a, a lot of uh, interest in some kind of movement and evolution of uh, what could be there. I apologize, however, this, um, the tools I have in my hands to help with this are too um, blunt to be able to, uh, to, to solve this problem here tonight. The, the, unfortunately, the stark issue is, is a retail establishment, the same use under our land use statutes and the traditions the legislature and the courts have set um, is that use similar enough to retail use that an alcohol establishment use could be considered a just an even transition from one to the other in the same location? I don't know of any zoning ordinances that actually don't make a distinction. And based on that tradition, I don't know where I would turn for the evidence I would need to support my legal conclusion that they're the same. So I'm not able to grant that uh, that request to make that uh, determination tonight. But I am pleased to hear of the dynamic and the momentum and the interest, particularly uh, by Mr. Hamill as the current property owner in trying to work out some other solution in a policy way using a tool that's that's a whole lot more uh, refined and, and uh, adaptable to the current situation. So I encourage everyone to do that I know that changing in zoning isn't that easy to do. At a minimum, such a suggestion would go to the Planning Commission who could craft the right solution and then recommend it to the City Council. But uh, that is exactly the location where these kinds of policy issues that have been discussed, the desire for the future community, how you'd regulate and control whatever negative aspects of these might be, those are, um, those are matters for the city council and not for an uh, administrative hearing officer. But again, thank you. And that's my conclusion to end this matter. Let's now turn to the second item. Um, this is a variance request by a uh, Ali Patrovi. I hope I didn't uh, mispronounce that too badly. Is Mr. Partro Partovi here tonight? Yes. Good. Would you or whoever would like to be of help to you go ahead and introduce me to the subject and explain why we're here? Sure, thank you. Uh, my name is Chris Jessup. I'm an attorney and I'm representing Ali Partovi here tonight. And with us, I think also is David Zimmerman, who is an architect who uh, uh, provided some of the drawings. Um, and by way of background, Ali is Iranian by birth. Uh, he immigrated to America 20 years ago. Uh, and in 2020, uh, he was living in a home that was owned by his brother-in-law uh, on Genesee Avenue, which is the subject property. Mr. Partovi has since become the owner of the property, but in 2020, he wanted to build a covered patio on the front of the house. Being somewhat versed in building requirements, he asked his neighbors uh, if he needed a permit to build the patio. And remember, this is in the context of COVID. Uh, and uh, 
uh, hard to know which agencies are open, uh, went to his neighbors and they said they didn't think he needed one, so he didn't apply for one and went ahead uh, with the build of the patio. Uh, and in December of 2020, the city issued a notice informing him that he needed a permit and that plans would need to be submitted uh, to the planning development uh, uh, planning department for review. Uh, Mr. Bartovi hired Mr. Zimmerman to- Did you say that was December, 2020? Yes. So um, about uh, 17 months ago, something like that. Correct. Okay. And so Mr. Bartovi hired Mr. Zimmerman to draw and submit the plans, and then he hired me to help with the variance application, and here we are tonight. Uh, and the question is, does the uh, patio qualify for a variance under Section 21A, 1860 of the uh, Salt Lake City ordinances? And of course, our position is that it does. First, literal enforcement of the ordinance would cause an unreasonable hardship to Mr. Partovi that's not necessary to carry out the general purpose of the ordinance. Uh, the property is very narrow and it's there's no outdoor area for, for retreat from the elements. The backyard isn't suitable for such a patio. There's already a, a uh, storage shed there and, and other storage areas. Uh, and Mr. Partovi uh, can't enjoy the property to its full potential without the patio. There's very little uh, room for shade in the front of the home. Uh, some of the adjoining owners have trees, uh, but it's really hard to put a, a large shade tree there. And, uh, and the next logical choice is to, is to build the patio. Also, there is a security issue. Mr. Bartovi has had uh, several items before he put up the patio. Several items were stolen uh, from the front of his house, his bicycle, a laptop, and other, other things. And since the patio has gone up, uh, so the patio has bamboo screens on it or other kinds of screens on it that can be raised and lowered. And it screens uh, his property from uh, uh, side from, from the street side of the property. Also, Mr. Partovi, um, uh, prior to the patio going up, there are a lot of homeless people in the area and they would come regularly knock on his door at night and bother him and ask for money or, or whatever they did. And since the patio has gone up, uh, that has stopped. Uh, and uh, so the, the patio uh, is necessary for security reasons as well. The second element under the ordinance is that there should be special circumstances attached to the property that don't generally apply to other properties in the same zoning district. There are 12 resident, residential properties on Mr. Partovi's side of Gen uh, Genesee Avenue. Five of them are 25 feet in width, and those that those are the homes at 817 West, 823 West, 835 West, which is Mr. Partovi's home, 847 West, and 849 West. Um, so less than and so, and the the lot sizes are not uniform in this area. There's a great deal of variation. Uh, so on Mr. Partovi's side of the street alone, less than half uh, of the lots are uh, 25 feet in width. If you go to the other side of the street, uh, there are 24 total residential lots, uh, uh, but still only five of them, uh, the same five that I just mentioned, are uh, 25 feet in width. Uh, if we count the whole block, I counted 49 residential uh, uh, areas, not, and there's a, an apartment building that I'm not including. Um, so 49 residences, we still only have five lots with a 25 foot frontage. That's only 10.2% of the lots, and Mr. Partovi's is one of those. So- and What are the widths of the other lots? They the vary, they vary greatly, uh, 30 feet, let me see. Uh, if I can see here. And I'll let me just mention that I took the measurements from the um, the plat map that's recorded in the Salt Lake County Recorder's Office and cross checked them against the uh, parcel viewer, the Salt Lake County Assessor's parcel viewer. And if mm -hmm. you give me just a minute, I can give you a feel for the size of the other lots. My computer will cooperate with me just a minute.
Okay, so several of them are 37 and a half feet. Um, some appear to be uh, 32 feet, uh, 35 feet, um, and then there are, and let's see, here's one. Mr. Uh, Justice, Mr. would you like to share your screen? Do you have something visually you'd like to show? I can allow sure. you to do that. Sure. Okay, you'll get a little box here that'll pop up and allow you to, to actually share your screen if you want to show something. Okay, I'm the presenter, so how do I share my screen here? All right, there's a little button at the bottom that says share. Oh, there we go. Okay, thank you. Okay. So here we're looking at the Salt Lake uh, County Assessor's um, uh, page with the with the parcel viewer. So the parcels that are 25 feet in width are uh, these ones right here. Uh, this is 849, 847, 835, which is Mr. Partovi right here in the middle, and then these two over here, which are 823 and 817, and you'll see that. Um, Mr. Partobi's, Partobi's immediate uh, neighbor to the east has a frontage of about 47 feet, 48, 49 feet. Uh, and you can see there's variation uh, among the lot, the other lots as well. Um, so there, there isn't a set width. And the, the point being that Mr. Partobi's lot is being 25 feet in width is among uh, the, the minority, the, the clear minority of the uh, 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 lots in the neighborhood and for obvious reasons. Um, and you can see Mr. Partobi's home. Well, let me get rid of that. Fills nearly uh, the width of his lot. Uh, there's just a very small space right there on the east side that is, doesn't abut right up against the property line. And so clearly there's nowhere to build on either side uh, of the home. So that leaves a building on the front or the back. And you can see here in the back, uh, the storage shed that's already there. Uh, Mr. Partovi put his uh, patio, uh, chose to put his patio on the front because that's the ideal place for it. Um, and the narrow configuration of the lot makes it very difficult to uh, uh, use the property without violating setbacks. Uh, because it's impractical to, to build anywhere. Uh, again, these conditions are related to the size and shape of the property and uh, come from circumstances that are peculiar to this property. Uh, um, okay, so the third element under the ordinance is there, uh, the variance is essential to granting a substantial property right possessed by other property in the same district. And it's Mr. Partobi's understanding that uh, other properties have been allowed to uh, build within the setback and have not been required to uh, and ob obtained variances. Uh, this property here on the end, 801 West on the corner, is a, a good example. Um, there was a smaller home here until a few years ago. Uh, and uh, uh, my understanding is that the home was enlarged uh, and uh, encroaches on the building setback. The home directly across the street uh, a few years Hang ago. On. This, Hang so. on just a second. Um, sure. And I apologize, but this is all new. There's nothing in writing that I've received or no outline of briefing sure. that I've received that provides this additional information. So it, it's a, to, sorry. Go ahead. Well, I'm just saying I can take notes, but not at the speed you're going. Oh, okay. There, are, yeah, we've alluded to it in the uh, uh, materials that we sent. There are photographs of some of these properties. Uh, we should have put some detail there uh, uh, with the materials that we submitted. Just a second, Mr. Jessup. A question then for the staff: Did I miss something that's on the in the file for this case? I mean, mm -hmm. all I got was a single letter, I believe, from Mr. Partovi. Let me look again to the staff report. There should be a hit. I'm sorry. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Thank you. 
Yep, so there should be his narrative and response for the application and then photos that he took of the the neighborhood as well as his drawing for the site that shows the covered porch and a uh, a map that shows the average set front setback for that side of the block. And I see some comments from neighbors as well yes. supporting. Yes. 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 Okay. I guess what I didn't see is the kind of extended uh, detailed review of that flat map that uh, Mr. Jepsit's providing. So again, I'm fine to take notes, just realize I get, might get writer's cramp here. So. Okay. I, and if it's helpful, we could certainly submit some additional detail if that would help in the decision-making process. Okay, thanks. So the 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 address of the home that's been recently replaced and enlarged and violates the setbacks? 801 uh, West Genesee. It's this house right here on the corner. I see. And are you saying there was no variance granted or that for some reason the city didn't wasn't concerned about the variance or the setbacks? <laughs> Honestly, I don't know the the circumstance. I uh, believe that uh, the home is it's it's in violation of the standard setback under the ordinance. Uh, I believe that a variance was granted, um, but I don't know all of the details. Or you're saying it's so recent that it couldn't be a non-conforming structure that was built before the setbacks were set. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I'll look into it the, a little bit while, while you are uh, with what I have available. I'll I'm look into to, it now while you are discussing. Oh, go ahead, Liz. Sorry. I've looked into it. I'm happy to answer that question right now. Well, let's not do it right now. Um, and maybe I'm getting too deep into the weeds here. Let's see if it becomes a big enough issue to, to spend more time on. But please go ahead, Mr. Jessup. I don't know whether that's the first of 16. So for examples, for example, or one of only two. Well, uh, um, there are other examples. So the standard setback, given that, uh, and Mr. Zimmerman may speak to this in more detail, but the standard setback for this side of the street is 23 feet. If you don't include this home that's on the corner, if you do include it, it's 22 feet. Uh, and there are other homes that are are well uh, into the setback. This one, for example, is nine or ten feet. Um, uh, this is the uh, let's see, what's the address here? A twenty three um, and eight seventeen also uh, sits within uh, the twenty three foot setback. Um, so the point being that there are other properties, uh, even on his side of the street, that are that encroach on the setback and uh, would be. I believe it would be unfair to uh, require Mr. Partovi to, um, under those circumstances, to take down his patio. And are uh, you saying those are newly constructed and not non-conforming? The only one that I'm aware of that's newly constructed it would uh, would be 801. Uh, I believe the others are pre-existing. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. The next element under the uh, ordinance is that the variance will not substantially affect the general plan of the city and will not be contrary to the public interest. Uh, okay, but be, before we go there, and I'm, I appreciate your engagement in this conversation. I hope it saves everybody time. What is the substantial property right in number three? What did do you have a precedent or something I can rely on that would say that having an outdoor patio involves a substantial property right? I, I don't at the tip of my tongue. You're uh, sorry. I just about don't said you're on a your honor. Habit. No, I'm <laughs> <there. laughs> sorry. Habit. It's okay. Thank you. Um, but, but, you know, go ahead if you'd like. So. Okay, so uh, the variance would not uh, substantially affect the general plan and, and is not contrary to the public interest. Again, it's a patio. There are no windows, no doors. It, no plumbing. It's not a permanent uh, structure like a house. Uh, and uh, as you have already noted, Mr. Partovi has obtained letters from 16 of his neighbors uh, who uh, uh, don't object to the patio and do not want to see it torn down. Uh, and finally, the patio observes the spirit of the zoning ordinance and substantial justice will be done if it's allowed to remain. 
the patio doesn't increase population density. It doesn't add additional dwellings onto the property. And it's in line with the precedent of other buildings in the neighborhood with their proximity to the sidewalk. And it's in line with the city's clear site zone area by staying 10 feet away from the sidewalk. Okay. Anything else right now? We will be back. Not at the moment, so I can stop sharing. <laughs> That's all right. Thank you. And let me turn to the city and see if there's someone who'd like to comment on behalf of the city. Sure. Hey, Wayne, can you can I share my screen? Thank you. Is that viewable? For you, it is. Okay. Ms. Hart, could you tell me your position with the city? Yep. So I'm a principal planner here at the city, um, and I'm the one that took this application in. So again, this is a variance request, and there are two um, actually variances that this does concern, and it's concerning the encroachment of the front and side yard of the property, and staff is recommending denial. Um, based on the standards required for granting a variance, uh, staff does not believe that the subject property has a unique hardship in order to be in compliance with the required yards. Um, and further, staff does not believe that the addition of a covered porch to a home is a substantial property right. Um, so just some quick wraparound. I know Chris gave this, but this is um, on West 8, 3, 835 West Genesee Avenue. Um, that's in the Poplar Grove neighborhood on the west side of the city. And this property was subdivided back in 1890 with the Albert Place subdivision, which you can see on this picture. Um, I do want to note that from staff's research, there is no indication that this property has been modified to what it was originally subdivided as. So 25 feet in width and 141 feet in depth. Um, and I know uh, Mr. Jessup said that a lot of the properties are a little bigger in width. Um, that is true. Um, I believe in my staff report, I came up with some um, kind of some basics that and I'm looking at just this block face right here where there are a total of 24 lots. So on the north side, there's 12 lots and they have an average lot with the 48 feet. And then on the south side, uh, which is where the subject property is, um, there's a, an additional 12 lots. Um, and that has an average lot, a lot width of 35 and a half feet. And as Mr. Jessup said, that out of the 24 total lots, um, there are only five that still have the 25 width. Um, but staff does not believe that the covered porch is relying on the width of the property in order to meet the required uh, front yard setback. Um, and that the depth does provide adequate space to do an addition in the rear and that, um, that the depth of the lot is seen with all the other lots in the, in the neighborhood. Um, and these were just pictures I took of the site of the of how the uh, porch is existing. So he did uh, build the porch without going through the proper permitting process. Um, as it exists today, it is not attached to the existing building, which does make it an accessory structure in the front yard, which is not permitted within city code. Um, that being said, with the application, the applicant did make it clear that it is their intention to attach it to the existing building. So that is why staff reviewed this application as it, though it were attached to the um, existing building. Um, so it is in the R15 or R15000 zoning district, which does set the front yard setback as the average um, setback for for existing buildings on the lot. And um, and staff agreed with what the applicant came back with was, was 23 feet. Um, and that was taken from just the south side of this block. Um, <coughs> and the reason why this is um, an issue of how the covered porch was built is because uh, code section 21A36020B um, 
it talks, it refers to obstructions and required yards. And so it does allow some obstructions in yards, but it specifically says attached, covered, and unenclosed porches are not allowed within the required front yard. And the covered porch encroaches the entire front, the entire required front yard, which um, staff has identified as the existing structure has set that setback at 23 feet. Um, and then in regards to the side yard, um, so the existing, so the R15000 district requires side yards to be a minimum of 10 feet on one side and four feet on the other, but the existing home actually has a side yard setbacks that are less than four feet on each side. So this makes it a non-compliant structure. Um, and the reason why that is an issue is in section 21A3805 zero B two C one one two refers to the enlargement of a non complying structure as two setbacks. So for interior side yards, it specifically states that in addition may extend the non complying exterior wall of the building up to 20% of the length of the existing wall. And uh, this is the drawing that the applicant did provide with the the application. Um, as you can see, the existing structure there is measured at 46 feet in wow. length and a 20% addition of that would be approximately nine feet, which the porch is, I, you can see on the red, on the, um, on the picture as measured from the existing structure all the way to where the overhang is, is about 16 feet in length. So this actually exceeds that allowed maximum extension by seven feet. Um, I do just wanna know also how staff is measuring this uh, structure. Um, so we're measuring it from where it meets the existing structure. And then there is an overhang. So not including the overhang, the structure is still about 13 feet in length. So it still encroaches the entire front yard setback. And then um, with the encroachment, the encroachment is three, about three feet, four inches. Um, so you add that, that gets you to about 16 feet in, um, in length. Um, so again, so staff, uh, does not believe that or does believe that the depth of the lot does provide adequate space for the property to remain in compliance with the zoning ordinance, specifically the ones I just mentioned. And um, we are recommending denial of it. And um, there is a more thorough analysis in my staff report, but I'm happy to go through any of that if you need me to. Um, and that does conclude my report in response to the applicant. Okay, thank you. Any other comments from the city? Let's let's turn to the public and see if there are comments um, from those attending and I'll open the public hearing at this point. Okay, yes, we did have a couple of people that would like to speak. Um, first, Kimberly Dearden, go ahead, please. Okay, um, so we're the neighbors that live just east of Mr. Patara Ravi. Um, and we have a huge concern about this patio being built. Um, one, the homes that he's referencing that are encroaching on the build out into the encroachment, um, those homes were built in the early 1900s and they are built with a porch, not a patio. All of the, all of the homes that he is referencing have porches as opposed to covered enclosed patios. Um, the other issue is um, we've lived here five years and in the five years, we've never seen Ollie ride a bike. So the fact that he's needing to have a covered area in order to store his bikes doesn't make sense when he can put him in the backyard he has a storage shed in the backyard that is locked that he can store them back there. They're out of sight. He wouldn't have an issue with any of the people walking up and down the street. Um, the other problem is that he's already built onto his house 200 square feet in the back and 100 square feet into the front without permits. 
And then he has gone and built this patio without a permit and now is asking for a variance when it clearly states that it shouldn't be there to begin with. Um, my last issue is when I back out of my driveway, I have already almost hit my one neighbor twice walking up the sidewalk because as I back out, I'm on the sidewalk before I can even see down the street if anyone is coming. Um, I find it an issue and if the variance is granted, my question for the city would be, who do I sue when I hit somebody? Is it going to be Ollie or is it going to be the city that gets sued for it? Beyond my scope of expertise, um, Ms. Dearden. Yeah, that's not a, something that our attorneys would have to address and our attorney is not here tonight. So our, our feelings for the Dearden are, we would like it taken down. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, next up, uh, Mary Ellen Sessions. Yes. Uh, I just have, I just have the same comments as the last lady. These homes were built. My family has been in this home for 120 years. It's been in the same uh, sessions name for 120 years, and I do have a porch, but Allie has not lived there 120 years, and the people that are encroaching, the homes were built in the 1900s, so. That is my opinion too. And you, there is no roll up screens. If you look, those are panels. There are not roll up screens. Okay. And that's all. I mean, I just think that he shouldn't be allowed to keep building, especially in the front yard, because we all know how big backyards are. He's got the biggest backyard as everybody else in this neighborhood yeah. built in the backyard. Okay, thank you. Others? Next up, uh, Corey Dearden. Sir? Please. So my concern is, are we setting the precedence that we're going to ask for forgiveness instead of permission? There is policies and procedures that need to be followed in order for things to fall into place. And so I agree that it needs to be taken down. Thank you. I do have a little bit of, of expertise on that subject. Um, the Utah Supreme Court has said that even if you don't get a building permit, you can get one later. Obviously, you suffer the consequences of having proceeded at your own risk and may have to redo things that don't comply with the building code. But the court did not uh, go so far as to say that a person who doesn't get a building permit needs to tear the structure down, get a permit, and then build it again. They just consider that to be too severe a remedy. And obviously that's just a big, broad policy statement by the court. Nothing that that uh, applies exactly right in every situation. But it, you did ask a question I thought I knew the answer to. So I thought I would uh, answer it. Thank you, Corey. Okay. Um, I don't see any more hands, but since I did this, for the last hearing, there are a few more people in attendance. I want to make sure that we give people all the opportunity that they can. Um, Dennis Ferris, would you like to speak on this matter? It's okay if you don't, you can just say you don't, no answer there. Um, Carlos, would you like to speak on this? No, no comment. Thank you. Thank you. And. Sarah, Sarah, would you like to speak on this? No. Okay, that's all. Uh, that's all the public comment we have. All right. Thank you. Well, so then let me turn back to Mr. Jessup and um, invite him to make any comments in response to the public or the city's comments. Your Honor, I would just sorry, <laughs> Mr. Call. Uh, I'll, I'll try not to wear a tie next time or something. Maybe it'll make it easier. 
uh, just direct you uh, back to, again, the, the 16 neighbors who, who don't object. And also, um, the ordinance allows, uh, uh, if there is a non-conforming structure, uh, uh, allows the applicant uh, or allows the hearing officer to uh, uh, direct the applicant to do something that can bring the structure into compliance. Uh, and if uh, you're inclined to deny the variance, then we would ask for uh, uh, what we could do to bring it into compliance. And, and Mr. Partovi does in fact intend to attach the structure uh, and can do that uh, immediately if, if he needs to. Thank you. And maybe that's too complicated to ask the city to respond to now. Um, Ms. Hart or others, what would he need to do to be in compliance? The, the information you provided on non-conforming uses and how they can be adjusted based on the non-conforming setbacks, I'm sure is uh, totally understandable to those who under, who do it all the time, but I'm a little bit at a loss of what that means. So I, I would say if, if there wasn't the issue of the front yard setback where the existing building does set the setback at 23 feet, I mean, he's, the code is very clear that covered porches, unenclosed covered porches are not allowed in the front yard. So while the existing structure is non-complying, the new construction of the covered porch is 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 not part of that because it's new construction and all new construction needs to meet the zoning requirements. Now, if it was built in the backyard, then the non-compliant structure section that I did reference saying like you could do the addition up to 20% of the existing wall, he could build that covered porch in the rear nine feet, extended nine feet. That would be the maximum he could do and that would be in conformance with code. Um, so, in terms of the front yard, it, I don't believe he would be able to come into conformance with the code at all. So, the what is the setback of the existing home? From staff's analysis, is twenty three feet. And that is, in fact, the average of all the houses on the street face. Yes, the house was built at twenty three feet from the front yard property line. And you're saying the code allows no flexibility to build anything beyond that, uh, not to build a porch. The court specifically says that a porch or a covered yes. structure could not be built there. Right. Yes. Okay. Any thoughts to that, Mr. Jessup, or other comments? No, Your Honor. I think we've said all we have to say. Sorry, <laughs> Mr. Call. I don't. <laughs> I don't want to make a bigger deal out of it than it is. I also just don't want to uh, overstate my uh, importance in the whole scheme of things. Force of habit. I see. Well, um, thank you. I appreciate the comments of the neighbors and appreciate the extended analysis of the, of the staff and also the extended work uh, that the uh, Mr. Jessup has done. Um, I think I, I agree, of course, there are five criteria that must be met and uh, in state code, which supersedes local code, they, they state a little differently, but generally the, that's the gist of it. Um, I agree there's a hardship imposed um, because there's already uh, specific, you know, there's already buildings in the back. I don't know whether that type of hardship is the kind that that would uh, would swing the entire decision but I don't I don't find a I don't find that to be particularly prejudicial to the request it does sound like there are special circumstances attached to the property that would be uh, important to deal with were the structure in the back um, as far as the spirit of the ordinance compliance with the zoning, I, I think basically that it would be difficult to grant a variance that met those criteria in this case because of the existing street faces and the uh, the average setbacks. My 
my my major issue is item number three, the substantial property right issue. To to frame it really narrowly, the argument would have to be made that it's not just a substantial property right to have an enclosed patio, but to have it in the front yard of a house that already has no that's uh, that's already just twenty three feet from the street, and specifically prohibited by the ordinance. So I don't find how the special circumstances associated with the property deal specifically with the front yard porch issue. The other circumstances, of course, other properties are much wider, obviously, and that, of course, has to be dealt with in trying to improve the structure and bring it up to today's standards and levels of comfort. But I'm, I just didn't see the connection on how a substantial right, a substantial property right drives the solution into the front yard. So, based on that, I'm not able to grant the variance. Um, but I do appreciate the, the conversation, the courtesies extended to everyone, and the, especially of course, the comments by the public and the, and all the work that was done to bring this to me and and help me understand all sides of the issue. Thank you. Thank you. That will conclude our meeting tonight, and uh, I will prepare some written um, information. You know, on both of the issues that have been uh, heard tonight, I'll prepare a written decision so that they can be reviewed and, if appropriate, appealed within 30 days of the date they're they're issued. Again, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Call.